Um, tonight we're going to have a discussion on um, rights-based morality versus utilitarian morality and whether there's a conflict and if so, how much. Um, so conventionally it's seen as um, obvious that utilitarianism and um, deontological views are opposed. They're classically portrayed as the two um, main um, branches of ethics. Um, <clears throat> but um, there are ways in which um, they might converge, um, as I'll get to a little bit later. So a classic example of the distinction could be the trolley problem, where um, there's, um, consider um, especially the the second variant of the trolley problem that includes a fat man on a bridge. So there's a trolley coming along, uh, headed toward five people on a track, and if it's not stopped, it'll kill all five people. Um, and you're on a footbridge above the track, and there's also a very fat man there. Um, and if you push the fat man in front of the trolley, then you'll save the five people by stopping the train. And the thought experiment assumes that there's no other way to save the five people. Um, you can't s sacrifice yourself because you're not heavy enough, um, and you can't signal to the train or do anything else. So there's an inherent trade-off between um, saving five people, and saving five people requires um, killing the fat man. Um, so the classic assumption is that utilitarianism endorses pushing the fat man off because five deaths is worse than one death. Um, Rights-based views say that it's um, it's wrong to violate the, the person's right um, to life and um, preventing greater harm doesn't um, outweigh that that rights violation. Um, so um, that's the standard picture and there are many more cases where you can imagine how this comes up. For example, um, should we allow animal testing if it offers the potential for greater um, harm reduction in the long term? Like if, it, if the medication saves enough people or um, helps enough animals. Um, of course, in practice, there may be cases where um, lab experiments are frivolous, especially in psychology realms or even um, just where um, lab animals are used far more than is needed for the benefits. But um, there might be um, some cases where this trade-off is more um, genuine. Um, so um, there are some um, arguments why the, the two views may not be in, in as much opposition as you might think. Um, so for one thing, humans are very much um, rule-following animals, and it's just a lot easier to um, like have, have rules of thumb that work most of the time than it is to make, make calculations in specific cases. So this is the basis of rule utilitarianism, which um, is kind of a middle ground in some sense between regular act utilitarianism and deontology. Um, the idea is that you have rules that in general, if followed, conduce to good outcomes, and that's maybe even better than trying to calculate in every case because the calculations can be faulty or there might be um, temporal um, inconsistency between what's good now versus what would be good later. Um, and so um, if you kind of stick to rules in the long run, that may um, serve you best. Um, one example that's sometimes given is if you're a tennis player, you should, um, and you, you're facing an unusual shot, you should still go with one of your habitual swings rather than trying to do something totally new because um, you haven't really practiced that and it's likely to, to um, be a worse outcome than if you follow something that's tested and that works in most cases. Um, so, um, so we can already see that rule utilitarianism is sort of a compromise between the two views. Um, and um, in general, you can up apply this thinking more broadly, like at the social level, for example. Um, laws work very well, and laws are sort of rule-based um, um, guidelines for conduct. And it would be a lot harder to require cost-benefit calculations because people would um, have different views on what that would look like. Of course, in economics, we can apply cost-benefit calculations often with success, and if there's a standard way to do things, then, then that might work pretty well, for example, for rationing med medical treatments or, or whatnot. But um, for especially for everyday decisions where it's just an individual um, making some decision on his or her own, um, laws are a much just more practical way to um, enforce um, general um, uh, social, um, pro-social behavior. So, um, that's another just example where in concrete terms the utilitarian ideal has to be 
made practical by being more de deontological, at least in an in um, applied deontological sense. Um, and then there are further um, kind of long-term considerations. For example, the, the, the idea of social norms in general is um, something that um, tends to work in practice. Like uh, when somebody, um, say, lies or breaks a law or steals or does some other um, violation in one case, it tends to degrade the principle as a whole more broadly because then other people feel that person um, was getting away with it, I should get away with it too. And so it kind of can encourage a spiral of um, breakdown of order. Um, and when you have, um, when you allow people to do their own calculations, it's much easier to claim that this was justified for the greater good. And people might even deceive themselves to thinking it was justified for the greater good, even though it was actually their evolutionary instincts that was pushing them in that direction, or um, they were just um, happily miscalculating things. Um, so we see this um, with the question about whether ends justify the means. And um, Elias Ryukowski has an article saying that the ends don't justify the means among humans. The idea being, um, historically, it, it seems the case that many humans um, either claim to be doing something net good when they um, encroach on others, or may even believe that they're doing net good um, when they encroach on others. And um, so the idea is that empirically, it seems that if you ha impose a sort of rights-based limits on what people are allowed to do, um, what he calls ethical injunctions, that may in the long run lead to better outcomes because just because of the nature of um, human psychology. It's conceivable that um, you could build agents that wouldn't have this problem. Um, and so that's why he says among humans, there are theoretical agents that would actually optimize um, utility based on appropriate calculations. But just as a, a long run lesson of history, it seems that it's, it's potentially dangerous to give too much control to um, certain people to um, do what they, what they claim is the right thing. Um, so then this kind of extends to real life cases um, like <clears throat> You might say that um, doing a uh, lab experiment on an animal is justified by the greater good, but then many other people will do the same experiments for much fr more frivolous purposes. And um, in general, it can just lead to um, make it more likely that people will abuse the system, essentially. So we see the same thing in other areas where um, something might seem like naively an imp a good thing to do, but it's important to enforce a social norm against it because of where it might lead. So this is maybe the classic slippery slope argument, um, which is sometimes called a logical fallacy. But in practice, we see that values do kind of um, approach um, new places by a steady um, trajectory. So the, there are many cases in which slippery slopes do apply. So um, that's kind of the, a way to, to phrase um, deontology in a rights-based frame, in a utilitarian framework. And there, there seems to be a lot of overlap between what this more sophisticated utilitarianism would endorse and what um, the rights-based views tend to endorse. So, of course, rights views have a language of um, natural rights or um, universal rights or um, the intrinsic imp rightness of um, the deontological framework, which is not... Um, is, um, is not like metaphysically um, valid, but f even from a, but it's kind of the way that humans think. And it's just kind of, you, the utilitarians can think of it as um, an instrumentally important way to help to build the, the system of relationships that tends to work well. Um, so there may still be some, some differences between the two views. Um, but if you take this more um, refined approach, then you can see that um, some some compromise between rights and um, utilitarian views may actually be the best, even from a utilitarian perspective. I think it is better on strictly utilitarian terms, for example, to have a, a, an absolute prohibition on torture enshrined in law, because this will actually lead to better, happier consequences. And likewise, uh, I think it would be very good uh, to uh, abolish the property status of sentient beings. Uh, this means, yes, uh, uh, changing the law, uh, and effectively this means closing down 
uh, factory farms and slaughterhouses, and I think this is the appropriate uh, framework for whether you're uh, uh, from a utilitarian perspective and also from a rights-based perspective. I mean, something like if one actually decides to enshrine in law the right of sentient beings not to be harmed, then all sorts of good consequences follow from a utilitarian perspective. And so in that sense, I think we ought to be aiming for a, a kind of high-tech Jainism. Mm -hmm. um, There's some trade-off between being flexible and being rigid. The, sometimes being rigid is to your advantage. Um, so one example is Parfit's Hitchhiker, which is um, discussed by Elias Yukowski, where you're um, stranded in the desert and you're going to die without um, access to civilization. And then um, somebody comes along, Paul Ekman, who's an expert at reading faces um, to detect whether people are lying. He comes along in a car and um, you, you, he asks, um, or you promise, um, I'll give you $50 from my ATM if you rescue me. And um, of course, once you get rescued, you have no incentive to follow through because um, you're already saved. So um, you may as well keep the money. So secretly, you're planning to not give him the money because... Um, once you're saved, it's um, better for you to keep it. So, but Paul Ekman is an expert face reader, and he sees that you're lying, so um, he leaves you in the desert and you die. Um, so it's important to be able to um, have temporal um, consistency in your decisions. Um, even once you're saved, you should still want to give him the money, even though at that point it's no advantage to you. So. Um, the rights-based view, the, the inflexibility allows you to win in a situation like that. If you can't change the rules all the time, then sometimes you actually do better because you can make these kinds of promises. Um, that's, that shows up in general with lying and stealing and deception. Um, the fact that you can avoid it even when it matters is what makes it work in the first place. Um, these seem, a lot of these seem more like strategic considerations or things that it's useful to implement under utilitarianism rather than um, kind of like uh, uh, well obviously there are lots of differences between the two theories but um, yeah the way we're discussing it seems more like strategic considerations that it's a good idea to use as uh, heuristics under utilitarianism because it leads to better outcomes right so um, as I said the kind of metaphysical or um, pure uh, moral realist conception of deontology is not what I'm suggesting, although many people think that way. And maybe thinking that way is the best way for many people to act because like in a practical setting, what's going to keep you from lying when it matters? Um, thinking about the strategic principle, you might just kind of think, well, just this once I can get away with it and it's not going to be a big deal. If you think in terms of this grander metaphysical system that may in practice, at least for many people, be a stronger way to um, enforce the behavior. Mm -hmm. Certainly if you have this kind of picture of um, the importance of temporal consistency in your decisions, then that can also be strongly motivating, but most people don't think that way at the moment. And so in practice, um, like just kind of commit commitment to principle is a psychological mechanism that seems to work well. Yeah. I like this um, in a real world example where the world doesn't end after the thought experiment. Uh, uh, reputation building is a very important part. So uh, the only w really uh, uh, safe way to make sure that uh, people believe you uh, is that you actually hold your uh, do what you say. So mm -hmm. uh, that would be a very strong reason for um, sticking with um, what you what one says. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Like, yeah, I, th I think like I agree with you, with your um, conclusions that like rigid rules are often have advantages for our malfunctioning hardware. But um, like I think the the ontology like promotes two two things that are very um, disadvantageous. First, like the this belief in natural rights and stuff like it promotes just mysterious, confused thinking, which is one case, and the second like. Or talk about it. The second one I think is like that the ontology like is a promotes an ethical satisfying mindset where people are they just think if as long as I'm not killing, not lying and stuff like I'm a good person and they will I don't know wake up in heaven and stuff like this. So and I think this uh, are the two advantages of utilitarianism.
Yeah, I mean, we all know that life is sort of messy and complicated and sometimes has these uh, difficult moral dilemmas, but whether or not to harm other sentient beings for frivolous purposes, I mean, this is not a, a moral dilemma, more or less whatever your uh, ethical framework, I would say, whether you uh, think of yourself as a utilitarian or rights-based or virtue theorist or uh, a Christian who wants to do good in the world, uh, harming harming other sentient beings, as I said, for something as frivolous as the fact that you happen to like the taste, uh, yes, I think should be completely taboo. Um, so though from a philosophical perspective, uh, some of these uh, debates are interesting. In, uh, yeah, in, in terms of practical consequences, um, yeah, I would say the first thing to do is just, yeah, to stop eating meat and animal products.